Sunday family dinner about eight or nine years ago, our daughter Robin said, uh, hey, we need to get together on Sunday nights. Talking with Robin one time and telling her about my growing up and my family met at my grandparents' house. They lived in Seaside and we went there every Sunday. Robin thought that was a good idea and that's how it all got started. They came, she came to you. I learned something new. I think for me, it's really given our family uh, time to connect uh, intentionally on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, all of us have just such a crazy schedule, and the older the grandkids get, the busier they've gotten. So it just becomes a time where we've all just set aside a time to be together that we can just catch up with one another in life and laugh a lot. One of the uh, common comments we hear from our kids is when they mention that they're headed here for Sunday dinner, their friends can't understand that we do this on a weekly basis and we actually want to be together. Each one appreciates the other and all ages interact. My age <laughs> and then being alone all during the week, most of the time. For me to have family come and stop in at any time during the day is a blessing because I'm, the days are long, but life is good. Even though we have different values and we differ on a lot of different subjects, we set all of that aside on Sunday night. We don't use it as a time to debate with one another on certain topics. We just enjoy one another's company um, and have a great time together. So the religious leaders were trying to kind of corner Jesus, try to cause problems. And they asked him a question. They said, Rabbi, teacher, what's the import, most important thing in all the law and all the prophets and, that, and that, that first portion of the Bible, all the law, the Bible, what's most important? They were trying to catch him and saying something wrong. And Jesus just so beautifully and clearly says really two things. All the law, all the prophets can be summarized with two things. Number one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, what's most important in all the scriptures up to that time in history? And it was relationships. Your relationship with God, your relationship with people. So we've been spending five weeks talking about this part of our relationships. We talk a lot at Shoreline about how we walk with Jesus. But we've been focusing on how we relate with our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues at work, our children, our grandchildren, our parents, our grandparents, our cousins. Our, every relationship can be made better if we take this book and what the Word of God teaches us about how to live our lives. So we, we kind of distilled it down for this series to five different practices, behaviors, five ways of living that will make every relationship less broken and more whole, more what God wants it to be. And so the first week we talked about communication. If you're going to have a good relationship, you got to talk. You got to communicate. How you talk, how you text, how you email, how you communicate, man, that makes a difference. If you missed that week, go back and watch it. It's, uh, it's on our church website. It's on, it's on YouTube, but you can watch that. The next week, Pastor Sean walked us through a powerful topic, did a beautiful job talking about forgiveness. Here's the reality about every close relationship you have, every one you will ever have. If it's a close relationship over time, at some point you will need to forgive them because they will do something to hurt you. And at some point they will need to forgive you because you've done something out of line because we're human beings and we mess up. And so forgiveness is critical and central to healthy, whole relationships. The next week, I got to talk about one of my favorite topics. Delight, laughter, joy, fun, play. If we're going to have better relationships, we need to lighten up and have a good time together. Learn to have some fun. So we spent a whole message just talking about how do we rejoice and celebrate life together. If you missed that, 
Watch that when I get caught up. Last week, we had Ed Stetzer come in. Ed is a renowned, he has a program on Moody Radio. He's the, the dean of Talbot School of Theology. Just in the last three or four months, he stepped into that role. Great guy. And he talked about if every relationship, if we bring our faith and bring Jesus in. Not in your face, let me shove it down your throat. Not that. Just be who, if you're a follower of Jesus, be who you are in Jesus and bring that spiritual dynamic to your Christian friendships and relationships and family members. And also, and here's the key, just be who you are as a follower of Jesus, even with, when you're with people who don't know Jesus. How do you live out that faith, that spiritual dynamic? It'll make every relationship better. This is our final week. And I'm talking about a, a topic that might seem obvious or it might even seem like, well, why would you put that in the top five? But it's critical and it's time. Time. You cannot have good relationships if you don't invest time. We live in a busy world with ever-increasing distractions. There's all kinds of things to keep our attention. If I told you today, if I said, listen, I love my wife Sherry. I'm crazy about her. She's the most important person in my life. You know, honestly, we haven't talked for the last three years. But I'm really close to her, you know, and I, she means the world to me. You'd go, you'd go, wait, wait, that one part you said, I missed that. You, you haven't talked in three years? Yeah, we never talk, but we, um, we don't spend any time together. But she's my wife and I love her. You might be fair to say, I'm not sure how much you really love her. <laughs> If you haven't talked with her and hung out with her in three years, right? That's not the case. We hang out together every day. But time shows the priority of a relationship. And listen closely, not just the amount of time, the kind of time. The kind of time. Because we live in a culture that is growing with distractions. Most of you carry around on you a device that streams more content than most people in the world 50 years ago ever were exposed to in their whole life. You carry in your purse or in your pocket a phone that can be an incredible tool for good. And by the way, technology, my dad was a computer graphics inventor and designer. He worked for Hughes and Lockheed. We had a computer room in our home before there were home computers. I love technology. I preach from the Word of God, but I preach on my iPad. See the picture right there? Yeah. Um, and so these pictures are on here. And so I, I love technology. I, I carry a phone with me. I, if you sit at my desk at home or here at the church, I have two giant monitors. And when I'm working, I normally have eight or nine different things open. I love technology. But it can be a distraction. Can I get an amen? It can be. And we got to recognize this and say there's great good in this, but there's also potential problems. I was walking through uh, Denver Airport about a week ago. And I just started noticing how many people... We're walking along like this. And they look up occasionally, and, and how many people were standing like this in a family of four, all of them on their own devices, nobody looking at each other, interacting. I started counting, and about seven out of ten people that I saw were either holding or looking at or fixated on a phone or an iPad if they were sitting down. Seven out of ten, including me, because I had my phone on me as I was doing that too. So I'm not throwing stones, I'm just saying. I'm just saying that, that it's, it's ever-present, right? And, and then... The tech companies did a great service to us by saying, listen, you don't have to carry that phone around all the time. We'll actually make you a little device you can carry on your wrist. <laughs> so you can have calls and texts and emails and constant distractions every moment of your day all the time. Like breath itself, your technology is bound to your body. That's they're going to do that until they can embed it in our eyes, right? It's like it's there, right? I can be talking with a person, having a conversation. And in the middle of that conversation, I've had it three or four times this last week, where they just stop the interaction and they just forget about me. And they click off. It goes like this. I'm talking, they're talking, a great interaction, and then they'll go like this. They'll go. Yeah? Every time. It's the same thing. It's a distraction. But there it is. Right? It, and, and then, how about this? Just all the streaming content. You have access to tens of thousands of hours I really, really need to watch the second year of the season of Three's Company, back when Suzanne Summers was still on it. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Some of you are like, I remember, right? Uh, and, and i, I got to watch it for the fourth time because I really need to get the, the deep meaning of these conversations. Know. But it's like, it's, it's there. It's there. And we have to acknowledge the world's a different place than it was before. Oftentimes when we have kids come back from Hume Lake, we have 120 kids going to Hume Lake uh, this summer. Yeah, isn't that great? And... By the way, thank you for giving toward that as well to help make it more reasonable. It's still expensive, but it's expensive for them to run the camp. 
All the spots are filled. We have a waiting list right now for junior high and senior high camp. But here's one of the things that happens when these kids get home. They'll say, it was one of the best weeks of my life. And a lot of it's because they were with friends. And a lot of it's because they're learning about Jesus and having spiritual experiences. But you know what a big other dynamic is? They don't have their devices for a whole week. They're unplugged. So here's what I want to say. Parents, give your, say to your kids, I'm going to give you a Hume Lake week at home. <laughs> give me your phone for a whole week. Just give it a try. It'll go really well, trust me. Uh, <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We understand that God wants us to learn the value of making time for each relationship that he's given us. God wants the right undistracted quality focused time, and God wants that for us. So I'm going to give you a vision for whole relationships as we look to our time. We're going to look at a couple passages from the Bible. If you have your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. If you have your Bible app, you can turn there. If some of you download my sermon notes in advance off the website and you already know what I'm going to talk about, the general idea, and also have your outlines in front of you or on your app on the phone. But Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 15. Listen to these words and just notice some of the subtleties that address the topic of how we use our time. All right? The Apostle Paul writes to the church. This is the church 2,000 years ago. But the ideas apply to today. He says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. So get ready, there's some wise words coming. All right? Making the most of every opportunity. Making the most of every, how do I use every opportunity I have in life? Because the days are evil. And that that doesn't mean every day, it doesn't mean time is evil. It means there's potential for all kinds of wrong, bad stuff out there every single day. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. That's an old word for lots of bad stuff, right? Leads to kind of a party spirit and making poor choices. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, worshiping together in community. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Just a couple thoughts from that passage. Use your time wisely. Make the most of every opportunity. Don't miss those moments of life that are so precious that you may never get back. Don't miss the toddler years as a parent or a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt. So busy you can't really pay attention to those little ones. Don't miss that. Don't miss the first two or three years of your marriage because you're both working so hard to make ends meet, but you don't have time for each other. I've stood up here and talked and prayed with so many people going through so many things. I talked to couples that will basically say we have no time for each other because we're just trying to survive. We have no time to be together. We have no time to interact. Our schedules are so convoluted and mixed up, but we're just trying to survive. And, and they say we don't know what's wrong or, or we don't feel close to each other. We don't have a strong relationship. And I'm like, well, you don't spend any time together. You're... you're They're missing. They're not making the most of this moment. First year of marriage is challenging for every couple. But if you're not spending enough time together, you can't work through those things. So don't miss those moments. Beware of time wasters. One of the challenges I want to give you today is I want to give you a challenge to identify one time waster in your life and say less of that or none of that. I don't know what it is for you. I can tell you some things for me that creep into my life. But I want to challenge every person online and every person in the worship center today that at some point in this message or sometime today you will say, this is something I do and I spend too much time on it. And I need to trim back on that. Or this is something I do and spend time on and you know what? It's not nearly as important as the relationships in my life. So I'm going to do less of this or none of this and just you can identify what that looks like for you. I'll share a story later about how God taught me some real lessons in that part of my life. But beware of time wasters. Be sharp in spirit and don't mute your senses. Stay sharp spiritually and don't mute your senses. What do I mean by don't mute your senses? The Bible says don't get drunk with wine. The point is don't use substances that lower your awareness of what's going on. I've heard people say, I had such a great time last Friday night. I was out partying with my friends. Oh, tell me about it. So I can't remember anything, but it was amazing. (laughs) Wait, it was a great night, but you can't remember? Well, I'm pretty sure it was great. Up to the point where I started to black out. Up to the point where I couldn't remember anymore. Up to, but my friends told me what happened. And it sounds like I had a good time. It's like, wait a minute. You know, when the Bible teaches something, it's not to take away our fun. It's to give us life. And life abundantly. Do you know that God wants the best life for you? 
So when the Bible says, don't get drunk with wine, and that, and so, well, good thing it doesn't say whiskey, it means everything, okay? <laughs> don't, don't, don't mute your, don't, don't do things that mute your senses. But be filled with the Holy Spirit in tune to what's good and beautiful and right. And you will find so much more delight in life. And I, I hope you believe that. I hope you embrace that. I, this part that talks about psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, worshiping together. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was in youth ministry, before I was, I was, I was still a full-time college student, but I volunteered at the church that I was part of, a Garden Grove Community Church, and eventually became the Crystal Cathedral. But I volunteered there, worked with high school students on Costa Mesa campus. About 15 hours a week, I volunteered to work with these high school kids. I was just a couple years older than them in college. I love these guys. Two of them, Phil and Mark, were in my wedding years later. Stood up for me at my wedding. These guys I got to know from Costa Mesa High School. But one of the things we did that was so much fun is we call each other and we go, hey, let's, let's meet at South Coast Plaza, a big mall down there in Orange County where I grew up. And, the top, and we'd meet at the top of the parking structure because there was no roof on it. And we'd circle up our cars and three or four of us would break out of our trunks, break out our guitars. And we would sit together, me and four, five, six, seven high school guys. And we would just sing praise to God for hour, hour and a half. Amazing. Then we'd get our skateboards and we'd go down the ramps all the way to the bottom, take the elevator up and go down the ramps again. It's kind of like those kids' toys where the, 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 the toy goes all the way down and then you crank it back up. we just do that with the elevator at South Coast Plaza. So we, we'd worship and we'd play. But it was so sweet and it was so good. When's the last time you got with some other Christians just worship God? When's the last time you said, I heard this YouTube worship song. Can I just play it for you? And you just sat quietly and drank in the words of worship and let your hearts come to the presence of God. There's great ways to spend our time. And there's ways that fill our time. But we're not making the most of every opportunity. Don't miss those times. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. And this is really focusing on wasted time. That we can waste time on things that just don't profit very much. Even things that might seem spiritual or seem important. We can get so caught up in them that our time gets filled with things. 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 7 says this. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people, so watch out for this, this is a warning, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. Don't teach things that are false. Or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculation rather than advancing God's work. Controversial speculation. Is there any controversial speculation in our world today? People constantly consumed with things that they may or may not be true, and they just, and now, should we be tuned into what's going on in the world? Yes. Should we know what's true and what's right? Yes. Should we spend, should, should we have cable news on 12 hours a day? Can I suggest, take this as ki a kind pastoral comment, that's probably demonic. And I mean that because the anxiety that produces, now, if you watch a half an hour, hour of news, see what's happening in the world, and you pray about it, and you try to be an agent of change in our world, praise the Lord. But when you're flooding your heart and your mind with anxiety producing speculation and argumentation, that, could, that may not be a good use of your time. And so it says they promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk, just babbling and babbling and babbling. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. And this can be true in the spiritual realm. People can get into spiritual debates. You know, entire churches have gotten into the topic of end times and talked about it for two or three years and then watched their church blow up and split apart. Starting next week, I'm going to kick off a new sermon series here called The Return of the King. We're doing a four-week series on the second coming of Jesus. But it's not going to be speculative. I'm going to tell you exactly when he's going to return. And let me tell you exactly what Jesus said. We don't know. But, he, but he, those things are taught for a reason, to prepare us. So if he comes today or in 10 years, we're ready. Or 100 years, we're ready. We're going to spend four weeks on it. But we're not going to argue and debate and we're not going to fight and we're not going to see our church divided over this. We're going to let unify our hearts around preparing to be, being ready to meet Jesus whenever he comes again. And so be careful of endless mental time wasters. Be care, care, careful of false ideas that consume your mind and that... that kind of churn around in your spirit. Be careful of anxiety-producing things where, where you're watching or listening to things that just, I don't know why I'm so anxious. So well, tell me what you do all day long. Well, I watch anxiety-producing media all day long. 
don't pray about it much. What if you prayed for every half an hour of news you watched? You prayed for half an hour. You go, I can't do that. Why? Because I'm watching news all day. Well, then how about, you know, but what if we balance that out? How do you use your time? Speculation, debating. Now, again, I want to be absolutely clear. We need to know what's going on in the world. Christians should be actively involved in changing our world for Jesus. We should speak and be heard. But we should not churn with anxiety and consume all of our time on things that we can't control or do anything about. We can have power in prayer. We can take actions. But anxiety does not create anything good other than good ulcers. And so be careful of that. Look at me at Luke chapter 10. In Luke 10, Jesus is, is with this family, uh, the, the family of La, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, this family in Bethany. And you need to watch. There's two different members of the family responding in different ways. And Jesus actually says, that's a good use of time. That's a bad use of time. Jesus, Jesus actually is really clear that there's right ways to use our time and there's wrong ways to use our time. As Jesus, this is Luke 10, beginning of verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that, she had, that had to be made. She came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? She's just sitting and listening to you, and I'm doing all the work. Tell her to help me. Look at Jesus' response, so, so gentle. Martha, 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 right? Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. It wasn't just this. It was just kind of a life pattern. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary's made a better choice. She's focused on me and the things of the kingdom. So Jesus says there's, you, you, there's choices to be made. So I want to just think for a minute about some of the realities and reasons for broken relationships relating to time. How we invest our time, what kind of time we invest, can either lead to a whole relationship or a damaged relationship or just, a <coughs> just kind of a neutral relationship. Nothing really good happening. Realities and reasons for broken relationships. Here's the first one. <coughs> Distracted time. When I'm here, but I'm not really here. You can be with someone and not be there. And we are really good at that. Oh, I'm really good at multitasking. I can spend quality time with my child and do the laundry and cook dinner while I'm really pouring into them. You can maybe spend time, but that may not be quality time. That's, that's fragmented, distracted time. It's easy to do that, but, but be, be careful of that. Distracted in your mind, distracted by, distracted by anxiety. Always worried about the next thing. Distracted by tech, whatever it is, to look and say, when I'm, when I'm with this person, when I'm interacting with somebody, am I there? Am I connected to them? Am I actually relating to them? Or am I there and here and here and here and churning? And, I'm, and, and you can kind of feel it, can't you? When you're with somebody and you can tell they're there, but they're not there. You can feel it. That's not a good feeling. So ask yourself, am I that kind of person that's always distracted? Or can I be present with someone? That's one of the problems. Okay, how about this? Wasted time. When I don't have time because I burned so much time up. I just don't have time for people. Why? Because my time's just disappeared. On what? On what? When's the last time you really studied your day and your week and your month? Said, so how do I use my time? Where do I use my time? And can I, can I reallocate some of my time to things that are more valuable and more meaningful? Am I getting soaked, sucked into things that take all my time and they don't matter that much, but the things that do matter the most, I don't have time for? And you say, well, I don't have time. You should better say, I haven't made time. Because we make decisions. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. How about exhausted time? I'm with you, but I'm so tired to engage in any deep way. Have you ever sat with somebody and you look at them and you just go, you're thinking to yourself, why don't you just go home and go to bed? <laughs> they're like, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be here for you. But they're just like, they're, you can just tell they're exhausted. That's not quality. People say, well, I, I wanna, I wanna, I'm going to give quality time. I don't worry about quantity time. I think people in your life need quality time and quantity time. Both. And we can give that. You can't give it to everyone, but you can give it to some people. So exhausted time. Be careful if you're giving somebody but your, your time, but there's just, you've got nothing to really, you're there, but you're so exhausted, you're really not present. And how about limited time? When I have to ration all the time. I've got so much going on, I can give, I can just, hey, hi, ho, hey, who, boom. And, but I, don't, I can't really slow down enough to give real time to anybody. 
I watched something as a young Christian. I became a Christian at a church called Garden Grove, Grove Community Church. The pastor's name was Robert Schuler, And then they, had this, they built this big glass building, the Crystal Cathedral. And um, I was there for a couple of years. I ended up working there. I ran their children's summer program, which is where I met my wife, Sherry. And so I've got a history there. And I remember watching, and I, I, call, I called it the Schuler Shake. And Robert Schuler, he had this, when he would greet people. He, now, here's the thing. Massive church. People come from all over the world to hear him preach. And so, but he would go to the, one of the doors and greet people as they were leaving. And he would shake their hands. But here's the thing. There's hundreds of people. And they all want to say hi to Robert Schuler. So this was what I called the Schuler shake. He would take their hand. He would say, he would say hey, nice to meet you. So, so thank Glad you came today. Have a great day. And he grabbed the next one. Nice to meet you. And he would literally, like, take their hand, hold their hand, and just move them right past. And it wasn't mean. I thought he's at least most pastors in that size of church would never even stand out there and shake hands. So that good for you for being there. But he could only give each person about, about 1.4 seconds. Hey, hi, thanks for coming. Hey, thanks for coming to Christmas. God bless you. And kind of pull them through. And some, that's sometimes how we live our lives. Every person we interact, hey, it's so great to see you. Great. Have a nice day. You know, and we just send them right off. Instead of just stopping and engaging. I love to be out front and greet people before services. And if you come in in the two different areas from the, I can show you on the map, but the park lot over here and the park lot over here, uh, I get a chance to kind of say hi. But if somebody comes over and say hi, says hi to me, I, I love to, I probably two, three times on a Sunday morning, I'll just stop and pray with somebody. It's like, well, but I might miss saying hi to other people. That's okay. They, you know, somebody comes in on crutches with a, you know, and I go, hey, what's going on? Hey, let me say a quick prayer for you. Somebody comes with a newborn baby. And I, I try to make sure I'm not just, I'm not just going the hi, 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 but in the midst of saying hello, if you need to slow down. But that's something I'm learning. Maybe in your life you just go so fast. I interact with a lot of people, but everything's just quick touch, quick touch, quick, and then you move on. And maybe you need to just kind of go, wait a minute, slow it down. Notice the need. Notice the joy and celebrate it. Get deeper in how you engage with people. So what are some pathways to healing, to hope, and to wholeness? I want to just share a few thoughts and a few practical things you might want to start doing that will help you move forward in this area. And I think all of us could take, receive some encouragement in this. So first, committing to both quality and quantity time. Commit the appropriate amount of time to the appropriate people. Children, if you have kids, they need more time. If you're married, your spouse needs more time. If you have good friends, you want to maintain those friendships, it needs time. There are certain relationships you go, this needs more time. And that might mean you say, okay, I don't have as much time over here. And you have to say no. And here's the thing. You have to say no to some things so you can say yes to other things. You follow? Can't say yes to everything. I wrote a book called No is a Beautiful Word. I was writing this book for 15 years for myself. I had most of the book finished in my computer, but I said, I'm never going to publish it. I'm going to just keep writing this for me because I was trying to learn how to be kind and gracious, but to say, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, God loves you and everyone else has a wonderful plan for your life. You know, and so people are like, I, I need this from you. And I have to say, when, when do I say yes? When do I say no? So I spent years just working on this idea just for myself. I was talking with, a, with one of my editors from a publisher, and he said, do you have any other books you're working on? I said, a couple of them, but I don't want to publish them. They're just for me. And uh, I said, I don't really want to write a book for a while. I'm going to actually create stuff online and give it away for free. And we just, He said, well, tell me about the books you're working on that you aren't going to publish. And so I told him about the two of them, and one was about saying no. And a week later, he sends me a contract. We'll publish the book. <laughs> I went to Sherry. I said, what do I do now? Because he's offering me a contract. And Sherry actually said to me, I think you need to write the book. I think it's time. But then what did I have to do? I had to create time for that and say no to some other things. Because every time you say yes to one thing, you have to say no to something else. If your plate's full, right? If your life is full, there's no room for anything else. I'm going to say yes to this. Either I say no to something or something just falls off my life. And it's usually the most important things that fall off. And so learn to say no. Learn to kind of measure your time and say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things. Devoting focused time when I'm with you. To be present. To be sharp. To be rested to be undistracted by tech. And if that means you turn your phone off or take your watch off, in my office here, in the upper corner of the building here is my office. I have my office where I work and I have my office where I meet with people. In the office where I meet people, outside of it, there's a little table and on that table is a charger for phones and iPads and, uh, and watches and all the technology. And if I'm going to meet with somebody, I'll say, take off your technology and put it on there on the charger. And I, and I literally, unless we're having a meeting that demands our computers, I say, leave your stuff out there. A lot of our staff members will leave, go back to their office, and they have to come back later and say, hey, I forgot my phone. I forgot my watch because they forget it was there. That's a good thing to occasionally forget those things because they don't own you. They're tools for you to use, right? But when people come and meet with me in my office, if I'm going to meet with them, I'm going to meet with them. 
not them and whoever calls in and whoever comes in and whoever, I, I'm going to spend time with them and I'm going to leave my technology out. Choose to be undistracted. Choose to be focused on your relationships and it will bring life to relationships that have kind of grown kind of cold. If you want a couple of great books on this topic, um, read, uh, there's a guy, Cal Newport, and if you don't write this down right now, you can go back and listen to the sermon and get this. Cal Newport, PhD from MIT in computer science. He's into computers. But he wrote a book called Deep Space, I mean, Deep Deep Work, and another book called Digital Minimalism. Deep Work, Digital Minimalism, both were fantastic books. Uh, his grandfather was a Baptist pastor, some of that kind of comes through, but he really is just dealing with the idea of not being distracted. In his own life, he says at a certain time in the evening, he turns off all the technology for himself and their family, they put it away, and they interact like human beings with the people who are there, there in front of them. It's challenging. And you wouldn't like it at first, and your kids wouldn't like it at first, and maybe at second or at third. But eventually, there's a point where they, people start to say, this is kind of cool that we can be together and not be constantly distracted by other things. Making space for fun. Play games. We'll take a vacation years from now when we can afford it. Just do a less expensive vacation and do something fun and connect and build into those relationships. Um, I've got the lyrics here from a song that I'm not going to have time to read, but if you want to read the lyrics of a great song or listen to a great song, there's a song called Cats in the Cradle by Harry Chapin. And, it, and, some of you are, and that basically, it starts with, with this, this, it's a story of, about a father and a son and how the father's so busy he doesn't have time for his kid. But then the kid says, someday when I grow up, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know, I'm going to be like you. And then later, the dad's older. And I'll, I'll read the last part. This is the dad's now older. And his whole life, he's been too busy, really, for his kid. But he keep, the kid keeps saying, I want to be like my dad. So here's the last stanza of the song. The dad says, I've long since retired. My son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you, son, if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I can find the time. You see, the new job's a hassle. The kids have the flu. But it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's sure nice talking to you. You know, click. And as we hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd, jo he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. Dad was never available when his son was young. And when he got older and wanted to hang out with his son, his son was never available because he was too busy. And he thought back and he said, that's just how I was. If you have never heard that song, if you're younger, it's, it's worth a listen. All right? Cats in the Cradle. Serving and sacrificial time. When you're with people, serve. Pour yourself out. Give of yourself to others. It's easy to get with people and say, what am I going to gain? But ask the question, what can I give? How can I sacrifice? How can I help you? What would you like to do? What do you want to talk about? You know, time is an interesting thing. Um, if I told you right now, if you're really busy, and I said, listen, I can give you 100 hours right now, 100 hours of free time right now, what would you do with it? Most go, I just, I, you have nothing to do. What would you do? How would you fill that? Let me ask you a bigger question. What if I could give you 33,000 hours? What if I could give you 33,000 hours of time? Well, I gave myself 33,000 hours of time over 30 years ago. Here's what I did. I didn't have enough time in my life to do everything that I knew God wanted me to do to be a good dad and a good husband and a good friend and do the work I was called. I didn't have enough time. So I had to look at my life and say, I, I actually I need about 20 more hours a week. I need about 20 more hours a week to do all the things I think that God wants me to do and to do them well. And I didn't have another 20 hours. So I looked at my life closely and I, found, I said, what do I do that I could get rid of? Now, I'm not recommending this for you. And some of you would say, I would never do that. And that's totally fine. This was for me, all right? I looked at my life and I realized I spent about 20 hours a week Watching sports, following sports, reading about sports, getting the sports statistics, making, you know, and, and I love sports. And I said, what if I cut out that 20 hours? And I didn't, didn't watch or follow any sports except for, I, could re I love golf, I could record the golf and you know, fast forward and think about half an hour to watch the whole golf thing, and I could watch the finals of different things. And I found 20 hours a week over 30 years ago. I did the math this morning just to get it right, and I've, and I, saved, because of that choice, today, over 33,000 hours. Now, if you ask me who won this or that, I don't know anymore. I used to love knowing all this stuff. And I, I could follow any sport. But I gave, now I'm not saying you need to get, I'm not saying that's wrong or even, that's, that's, that's a fun, some, it's fun and entertaining. But it was 20 hours a week of my week. And that's, I don't have that information anymore. But what I do have are rich relationships 
and a walk with Jesus. And I chose to give that up. There's something that you may need to give up to make time for things that matter most. Reciprocal time. Who's poured into your life? Who's given you time that you need to reconnect with and say, I need to give you some time? There's people that, that care for you and pour into you. How do you give back to them? Could be a parent or a grandparent who just had loved you so much growing up and they mean so much to you, but you just never have time. Maybe this week you go, you call and you say, hey, Grandpa, can I come by and just spend an hour? Can I bring it? Let me, is there a snack I can bring, something you like? And can we just hang out and talk? I want to just and ask questions and listen and turn off the technology and just, just be a human being talking to another human being. Who are people that have poured into your life that you haven't seen for a while? And maybe your application today is, I'm going to reach out and spend a little time with that person. Making time for those who matter. Who matters the most? Who needs the most of your time? Who's closest to you? And are you giving the time that you need? Here's the trick about all these different five topics about whole relationships. I don't know how it applies in your life. I know the concept. I know we need to be forgiving. I know we need to communicate. I know we need to make time. It's Now it's up for you to get on your knees, to be quiet, to talk with Jesus and say, who needs more time? What, is that? what do I need to give up to make time? How can I be more present when I'm with people? You will not regret taking this seriously. So Jesus, as we finish this conversation together about relationships, as we finish these five weeks, we pray that we would communicate more, that we would forgive quickly like Jesus, you forgave us that we would learn to have fun and enjoy life, that we would have great spiritual connections with people, Lord and Lord Jesus, that we would make time for what matters most. Help us to have whole, healthy, dynamic relationships just like Jesus you want us to have. We pray this in your name, with your power, and for your glory. Amen. Before I have you stand and send you off with a word of blessing, um, we have a baptism class today. If you want to be baptized and you've never been baptized, if you want to be baptized, please at 12.30 today in the Peninsula Room, which is on the main floor here, go to the Connection Center. They'll show you where it is. 12.30 today. And is that class online as well as on campus? I don't know. I think it's just on campus. So online, we'll let you know when we have a baptism uh, opportunity for you. Second, spiritual gifts class. If you want to know how God's uniquely made you and gifted you so that you can then use those gifts to bring him glory, to make the world a better place, to make the church stronger, today, right after this service, <coughs> right after the 11 o'clock service, on campus, my wife Sherry will be heading to garden room upstairs here. If you want to go to the spiritual gifts class, that would be a great way for you to kind of grow in your spiritual journey. Even if you weren't planning on it, just jump right in there right now and join Sherry. And again, it'll be after 11 o'clock service. And then at noon, uh, at 1 o'clock online, Sherry will do the same class online with you. And so join her at 1 o'clock, go online and register for that. If you need prayer for anything online, live chat with your host or send us your prayer needs on campus, come up front and our teams are longing to pray with you and for you. And then if you're new today, we're so glad you're here. If you're on campus here, before you leave campus, go by the Connection Center in the lobby and just say, I'm new, and they want to give you a gift. Thank you for coming, answer your questions. You could also go to the Connection Center to learn about, about the Shoreline Emergency Response Team ministry, about being on the parking team, any of those things. Go by about moving up to the next grade, all the Connection Center, they'll answer your questions. And if you're online, uh, we give you a warm welcome. Just text the word welcome to the number you see on your screen, and we want to give you a warm personal greeting as well. If you're able to stand online, courtyard, family worship venue, on campus, stand with me, and just, just quiet your heart for a moment. I'll say, give, give, give me 30 seconds to speak a word of blessing over you. Just give this time and receive this. Don't think about where you're going next. Just quiet your heart and receive this. May every relationship you have be blessed by Jesus. May you love people well and receive their love well. May you make the most of every opportunity for the glory of Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you all soon. When something says I'm not worthy, I'll point to the empty